Ted Nelson, and I've been serving as a chaplain for Gulfside for close to five and a half years. It was mm -hmm. five years this past September. And so currently, my primary assignment is here at our Rocky inpatient unit. Mm -hmm. And so prior to that, I served in the field for about three and a half years. So did a lot of home visits and some facility visits. And so now it's primarily here at the inpatient units as well. So we generally, our staff are here uh, throughout the week, Monday through Friday. So Rucky is pretty unique. So the nurses are here 24 hours. So I work collectively with our team of social worker. We have a discharge planner, nurse practitioner. So we will generally come in each day. We'll reconcile, okay, yes, who are the new patients we've received? Who have we visited? Um, the expectation is that any new patient who comes in that we offer them a visit. Uh, within three calendar days mm -hmm. from when they arrive here. And that's really any patient, if they're brand new on our services or maybe they are brought in, they're an existing patient for us as well. And so my role as chaplain is primarily offering spiritual support and emotional support. And then so along with our social worker, I, I feel like we have a cohesive team mm -hmm. and I, I believe that it takes a team. It's not any one of us. And so, I'm there as, as chaplain if the family is needing resources, um, whatever it may be to assist their family, then that, that then would often turn to the social worker. So we, we take the first part of our day, if you will, we, we get here uh, generally from eight in the morning until five in the afternoon. And so we will go through, there's a patient list every morning that comes out. So we, we know, okay, uh, how many patients we have and what rooms they're in. And so we'll also confer with our nurse practitioner and discharge planner. Uh, they come in and do their rounds each morning. So we're getting a feel as quickly as we can with, okay, what is the status of this patient? Um, we try to determine, is it likely they may remain here um, if they are near end of life? Um, or will it maybe be appropriate potentially for them to leave either to home or placement somewhere else? So. It's kind of compiling all of that information and then getting a feel for who these patients are. We, we just get an understanding of, okay, is their family present with them? Are they by themselves? Uh, we wanna check things like advanced directives. What do we have in place for them? So I feel that it's a lot of preparation leading up to the, the, to the visit so that we hopefully have the information we need when we're there. Um, a lot of what we do is reinforcing our purpose with hospice, our philosophy. So throughout the day, Juliana, you know, we're, we're beginning visits in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, the, there's a lot of freedom with what we do, but the expectation is that the patients are seen. And I think, I feel we take that very, very seriously, mm -hmm. you know, and we can introduce our role and who we are and why we're here. I think an important thing too is we're always conferring with one another. Um, if there's anything our nurses are needing, um, one another is needing. Um, it, is, it is a very steady pace often. Mm -hmm. um, so just tracking, okay, who is here, maybe who may be leaving, who may be coming in. Um, and so we're here throughout the afternoon. Um, I think another thing unique to Rucky is that we are, they call it post-mortem support. So in the event that a patient does die here, we're here for the family. Mm -hmm. So we're here as they're grieving. We're here for emotional support and bereavement, grief support. Mm -hmm. um, so I, that may be, I, I guess, a, a pretty long-winded answer to your mm -hmm. question, but um, e each day is, is very unique. No mm -hmm. two days are the same. Uh, and, you know, some visits may be more complicated or lengthy than others, right, depending on what the need is. Um, but I think this is ultimately a place where families feel welcome. They can stay overnight if they need to, and so we reinforce that with them. Mm -hmm. um, and they can come and go as they need to. I learned early on, uh, prior to coming to hospice, I, I did a, a residency at a hospital called CPE, Clinical Pastoral Education. And then I had done a, a brief um, uh, internship with hospice prior to that. And so I was drawn to spiritual care at end of life. But I, was, I, I learned early on too that 
it's not about any agenda that I would bring to a patient or family or to a visit. That it is ultimately the reason I'm there is to serve the family and patient and to support them where they are spiritually. So as a, as a chaplain for hospice and with golf side, I think one of the beautiful things here is that it is interfaith. So my background is Christian Protestant and I can bring that certainly that molds who I am as a chaplain, but ultimately I'm learning from, I'm honestly learning from the patient and the family, what they need. What is it that brings them peace, fulfillment, you know, particularly at end of life. And you can explore that. And there's, you know, common grounds. Mm -hmm. Even if we don't share the same faith, it might be a similar faith or no faith sometimes, but ultimately, okay, what what is it that you are needing to make this as peaceful as it can be, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, there's, there's a really special program at, at Gulfside called um, Hospice Heroes. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it's, it's funny because it's difficult to keep count sometimes, but there are numerous families. I, I, I feel like they're, they're often compelled based on their experience with us to want to give back, right? And so it's amazing to see the generosity of people. And it's, um, it kind of covers a whole range, but when, when a family uh, expresses interest and, you know, we have our, I know that I've reached out many, many times to, to Carla and, and I think Jane now, they're, they're really great with what they do, you know, just being so present in the community, right? Because I think, I mean, that, I think that's also so much of what this is about. Mm -hmm. It goes way beyond, you know, these walls. Um, so when a, fam when a patient or family expresses interest, like they just want to say thank you to both sides, and they, they do want to give a donation, so that there's recognition to the staff, and there are some of the, some of the words and actions that come back to us um, are so moving, and it's just a reminder of why we do what we do, you know, and so there's families that have wanted to give, you know, there's a butterfly garden right out here at Rocky, there are benches, uh, it's kind of like the sky's the limit to what they can do, you know, mm -hmm. and there, there's, there's a, uh, in, in the hallway here at Rocky, you know, there's a wall with names on it. And I, um, just to stop and, and take time to appreciate the names that are up there and you recognize the names of right, patients that we, whose lives we touched. And, mm -hmm. um, so I, I feel it's really humbling and honoring. I, you know, it, it's, it, it's honestly, I, I just consider it um, really a blessing that a family would want to give back mm -hmm. and that they do give back. And, and it, that is such a huge part of, I think, what keeps Gulfside going, mm -hmm. right? And so it, it's just, it's, I, I'm grateful um, when someone will take the time themselves to personally thank us. And, and, I, and I know it's, it's, it, it's 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 um it's nurses it's social workers it's other child it's across the board you know, um, but and it's one of the things we also do as chaplains um, from time to time, a family will ask if we can help um, support them in leading a memorial service right or presiding a memorial service, and they may want to just give right um, and so that then becomes you know, a donation to golf side. So it's like we can accept that from the family on behalf of golf side. Mm -hmm. And it's just a beautiful thing. I mean, it really, so I think it's awesome that golf side does it. I mean, it's it's just, it's one of those reminders. It's it's uplifting, it's affirming, like it just, it, it reminds us why what we do is so important. Mm -hmm. And and I think, it, it, and, and I think we can just remember that every day. Uh, is, is is really important just just to be reminded of that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of times those go hand in hand, but but also what comes to mind right now is I'm grateful that I work along such a dedicated social worker as well, right? So there are definitely emotional needs and I think we are there to offer education that 
there are some really necessary and important conversations to have, whether it's final arrangements, whether it's against record, that we realize these are not fun things to talk about, but we need to talk about them. And so we, we offer the space, we offer resources, and we will often say it is, we feel it's far better to do this sooner versus having to do this when it just emotions are so fresh, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's recognizing that aspect. And then, so there's, there's certainly the emotional part of it. And then when you think of the spiritual, there are certainly patients here who I think the sense that I get is that they feel at peace. Um, there, there are no signs that they're uh, distraught. Um, you know, that, that's, it, it's, it's my hope and prayer that it would be peaceful for every person who comes through these doors. Right? Mm -hmm. So when we think about that, where I think this, the spiritual piece is so important is that when a family member or a patient tells you that there there is there is a burden they're carrying, there's they're they're seeking reconciliation, perhaps they're there's they're they're seeking uh, something to hold on to because I think with end of life, you know, there's so much that is like I use the word intangible, unknown, and there's an element of mystery, right? It's so from, from, from a spiritual standpoint, we, we can fall back on our faith and lean on our faith. But at the same time, I think it still invites questions. And so there are patients who question, why, why am I going through this suffering? Why, why, is, why is it the way that it is right now? And there may be no answer, but we can explore with them and see, okay, look, would this possibly offer you comfort to think of it in this way? Mm -hmm. So can we maybe reframe what you're thinking and look at it from a different point of view where there is there is a sense of hope, there is a sense of comfort. Um, and I think I can appreciate as a chaplain, they're entrusting so much to us mm -hmm. at, I think, uh, such a significant time. And it gives us opportunity to if they're needing to hear a loved one's voice, um, to see a loved one, we can do our best to figure out what what it may be that, it, that they are needing, if that makes sense. So where I think the two of them often come together is a patient may very well be holding on or fighting or waiting for that particular loved one for example, right? And so it's doing whatever we can to provide that, or at least to try to facilitate. So um, again, it, I, 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 feel, I feel just kind of in awe that we're given the opportunity to be with them as they're going through this. But, but ultimately, okay, what will lift this burden? What, what will ease this pain and distress that you're in, right? Mm -hmm. how, how can we together um, find a way that, you, you, that this could be more peaceful for you. I think ultimately that's, that's what's important. Yeah, thank you.